Word of God from the Gospel of St. Mark at chapter 13, verse 1 and following. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Will there not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down? The Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable, or in the name of Christ become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. One of the greatest privileges that I've had in my life to this moment has been the trip that Debbie and I recently took to Israel. We were a, a test group. You can look at me and tell me that I'm a test subject. And uh, we were the first group allowed in country without a 72-hour waiting period. So while we were there, we were the only tourists in the country, from outside the country. And that's significant because places that you may have gone to in days gone by and waited hours and hours and hours just to get a two or three minute peak. We got to walk in and just sort of wallow into the experience. It was amazing going right into the various buildings and sites that you read about in scripture in Bethlehem and Caesarea Philippi, and the Dead Sea, and various other places, all inspiring. And there were some funny things, too. I mentioned we didn't have the 72-hour waiting period. We had to prove that we'd had a test, negative, within 72 hours of, of arriving in country. And so we went and had a test done at a hospital, and uh, Debbie and I flew in, and before they let us leave the airport, they again repeated a test. And then they stuck us on a bus. And as we were leaving the city of Tel Aviv, the bus pulled over on the side of the road. And two women got on, and we were told these women were nurses, and they were going to draw our blood. And except the fact that the materials in their hands looked professional and sanitary, I don't think anybody would have gone for it. But they drew our blood and said, now you've got to stay uh, in isolation until we get the result back on this blood test, probably by 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm bouncing off the hotel walls, just going crazy and trying not to wake up Sleeping Beauty. And so I decide that since there's nobody else out at 2 o'clock in the morning, I can wander around outside. It turns out all the busboys and waiters for Caesarea Philippi are street kids. And when the tourists go in at night, they lay down on the lounge chairs and on the various couches and sleep outside between the hotels and the Sea of Galilee. And so I'm wandering around and they see me by myself and I think dollar signs appeared in their eyes because they all started going towards me like they should make me feel uncomfortable. I walked through the middle of them. I grew up in Frazier. That's nothing. <laughs> that is no, They're not near as fearsome as they thought they were. And so there were funny things. The saddest sight was in Israel. At the side of a destroyed building that has been gone almost 2,000 years. But at the retaining wall surrounding the base of the building, Jews gathering by the multitude to pray and to worship. Because to them, worship is about a building. And the disciples, seeing that building as it stood in all of its finery, said, what 
magnificent stones. What a, what a tremendous building. And Jesus prophesied the book was written around 59 A.D. By 72 A.D., the building was destroyed. Jesus prophesied the destruction of that building. And his point is that God is not confined to a building, nor is the worship of God solely confined to a building. In fact, no physical outward trappings should contain our worship of God. In John 4, Jesus tells the woman at the well that God was actively looking for people who would worship not in the right location, not in the right building, but would worship in spirit and in truth. Now, if you wonder what spirit and truth means, alternately that can be translated as in the spirit of truth. Authentic worship, to declare value, worship, is rooted in the word worth-ship. To declare value, O oh God, you are supreme. There is none beside you, O oh God. He looks for that. And worship is not contained in this building or in any building. Now, I was raised coming to church. I love church. I love church buildings. But let us never substitute the idea that the building is the worship. The worship is from the people and to God. And thankfully, we in this community have such a lovely building to gather in. But you know, some of the deepest worship I've known has been in the hospital looking at a newborn baby, thinking what a mighty God we serve, that he could create such a being as this child. I, I won't try to make you jealous about telling you what it's like to live in a house on the Tennessee River where we get to watch the sunrise and the sunset on the mighty Tennessee, so I'm going to skip over that portion. <laughs> All I have to say is, na 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 <laughs> but, but nature speaks of the Creator. When we look at creation, we understand that's only an imitation of the one behind creation, the creator, who spoke and created all that is, who continues to sustain. Some of the best theology I've ever written, I've ever read, was written by scientists who study subatomic particles. Years ago, I read one scientist who was talking about, you get down to the level of the uh, quarks and the neutrons, and you don't understand how this solid material looks like uh, a field of stars. And the scientist said, we really don't understand what holds all of physical property together. Because if you magnify sufficiently, it looks like a, an asteroid field. And I think, not only do I know what holds it together, I know his name. There is a building that God desires, a physical structure that twice, once in Hebrew Scripture in Amos, once in New Testament in Acts, God says, I'm going to rebuild it. And it's a physical structure. Over in Acts 15, at verse 16, quoting Amos 9, 11, and 12, God says, after this, I will return. God speaking, I will return. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. What is this tent of David? David, technically the word there is tabernacle. 
It means a temporary structure. On the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the rules when you build your tabernacle and you dwell in it is you have to be able to see the stars through the roof. It does wonders for your prayer life. Lord, don't let it rain. <laughs> what is it about this tent of David, this tabernacle, that God wants to rebuild it himself? It's about worship. It's about a place where God was worshipped before there was the temple built by Solomon. There was a tent, a tabernacle. And David led worship there and it went on 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 and a fourth days a year for over 40 years. Worship. There was no separation, holy of holies, from the rest of the place. There was just worship of God. And it went on day and night and night and day. And Amos adds the idea that in addition of it being a place of worship, it was a place of outreach so that Gentiles, that is the non-chosen people, that means you and me, could find God. So what is God looking for? He's looking for a place of worship. He's looking for a place where the outsiders become insiders, where they are reached out to and brought in and become family of God. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. <laughs> Not a building of finery, but just any old tent. As long as the worship is authentic, as long as the outsiders are reached out to. And the text continues, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, the reason I emphasize the word opposite is we heard opposite last week. Last week he was opposite the treasury. This week he's opposite the temple. Mark doesn't use those words by happenstance. He wants you to know that Jesus is against this idea of a fixed structure, a religious system that goes on whether or not God is there. Opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will be, talking about the fall of the temple, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray more important see that no one leads you astray many will come in my name saying I am he I had uh, a unique experience in my childhood my mother spent about as much time in and out of mental institutions as she did in my home uh, she had a condition, a mental condition that was easily treatable, but part of her desire was not to receive treatment. And so she would say everybody else is crazy. She was the only sane one. But in one time as a eight-year-old boy, I went and visited her in the Memphis Psychiatric Hospital. And uh, waiting for her to come out of her room, uh, an elderly man came up to me and he said, uh, he said, my name is Jesus Christ. And he handed me a sheet of paper that he had torn in fourths. And he handed me a fourth of it. And he said, this is your ticket to heaven. Not everybody who pretends is that crazy. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Did you catch the idea that false messiahs tend to arise when there are wars and rumors of wars and people get scared and we look for somebody that's got easy answers and can give us assurance, you're going to be okay, everything's going to be just fine, just follow me. Instead, our Savior says, take up your cross, that's an instrument of death, take up your cross and get in line, come on, follow me. And he's going to his cross. God doesn't give us easy answers. He gives us true faith that will sustain us 
in the midst of any kind of trial. And, you, when you, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. One of the things Jesus guarantees is there's going to be trouble. And just because the trouble doesn't mean the end is here. How many of you have heard somebody within the last year say, this has got to be the end? You know the trouble with that? When the end doesn't come after like a year we've had or a year and a half that we've had now. When the end doesn't come, we think he's not coming. He's coming. And it's going to be as big a surprise the second time around as it was the first. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.